Um, as you may or may not know, this is our third anniversary. Woo! And just, just out of curiosity, who was at that very first meeting in Meg Week's room at the high school? And we're still showing up. How about that? And then look at all the other folks we've picked up through the years. We have brand new people, a couple brand new people here, who are, re who are related to our beloved Lisa DeVecchio, who we mourn that she moved. But at any rate, they're going to take all our good vibes back to her. So what we're going to do to start out is Steve Prang, our uh, videographer extraordinaire, who now I can no longer watch the meetings because I'm on the videos. It's just beyond anything I'm going to do. Uh, has created his, his yearly, annual, I guess we should say, video of everything we accomplished this year. So we're going to go with that first, and then we'll start with our presenters. somebody in need you, you help them out any way you can if you can but just having a conversation and being conscientious about helping is all any of us can do We treasure our water. Um, it's so important not only for our economy, but for our recreation and, and just our way of life in this state. It's an important uh, issue nationally, but it's particularly sensitive in areas like ours that are just full of lakes and a river that runs right through our town. and in solidarity with the survivors of gun violence. That we are going to stand up to the gun lobby and we are going to stand up for our people and their safety. 98% of Americans want universal background checks. They want safety for our communities.
I, first and foremost, I just want to start by saying I have heard such positive information about the Indivisible Group, and I am so thankful for you. I am thankful for you inviting me here this evening to talk a little bit about the two ballot proposals that we are asking voters to consider on, on November 5th. And really showed that democracy works when citizens get involved and show up. And starting next year in 2020, uh, we will have a new process for redistricting in Michigan that's going to be more fair, impartial, transparent, and most importantly, led by citizens. Michigan Liberation is a nonprofit criminal justice reform organization, and we work in coalition with other groups to share our values. Right now, we have teams in Oakland, Wayne, and Kalamazoo County. We're here today because we are in the midst of a public health crisis. A package of universal background check bills because we cannot ignore any longer this senseless violence. Uh, there's no responsibility more important to us than ensuring the safety and well-being of families throughout our communities and throughout the state. The damage of cutting Randy's life short still affects our family every single day. living section. So this is about providing guidance to people in the community about how to live a sustainable life. Yeah. With waste reduction, uh, it's really about helping our community use less. So uh, we everyone knows the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. these past 15 years we have continued to gather here as one community dedicated to honoring the dream the message the legacy and the sacrifice of a great American hero and all the heroic leaders of the civil rights movement I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yes. I have a dream today. So the applause is for Steve for preparing this. But also to all of you who took the time to show up and represent. <laughs> Technologies, not my thing, so I'm not judging. Um, no, really, we we have gained the respect of indivisible groups across the state because of our level of involvement and because we consistent, yeah, consistently, there we go, show up and get it done. And I think that you should all pat yourselves on the back. That is all of you, not just one or two people. So, very cool. So the thrust of our meeting today is, how are you going to get involved now? So we have with us John and Susan er Eric. 
Oh, I got it. Um, they have been amazing in developing a network of precinct delegates within the Democratic Party throughout Oakland County. Democrats are grossly underrepresented at this level of, of government. And we did a lot in the last two years ago. A number of us stepped up and ran for precinct delegates. So we had, and they are taking applications tonight, should someone want to run again. But it's a little different than being a precinct delegate in the Republican Party because in the Democratic Party, everybody can vote at the convention that's a, a, a member of the party. But what happens when you have precinct delegates is you have somebody in that neighborhood who knows those neighbors who when we're going out and canvassing and we're going out in phone banking and writing cards, we know the, where to go. We know those people. So getting us involved at that grassroots level within the force for change um, is so important. So they're going to talk a little bit about what they do to get you ready to do that and their program. Hey, Indivisibles. Great to be here tonight. My name is John Eric. This is my wife, Susan. Uh, we're the co-chairs of DIPDOC, Democratic Precinct Delegates of Oakland County. And <laughs> Thank you, Julia. I appreciate it. <laughs> And, uh, we've been at this for two and a half years, and we uh, I came off of um, Voters Not Politicians. I was the Oakland County Director of it uh, at the beginning of it, and I'm sure there was a lot of circulators here, and I'm sure there's even more signers here. We did 94,624 signatures out of Oakland County, number one in the state, 20,000 more than any other region. You guys did it. You knocked it. Thank you so much. That's coming in 22, so, you know, there isn't going to be any resting until we get that straightened out. But uh, the thing we're pushing is precinct delegates. We... Um, shifted into that because it was very weak in the Democratic Party. It's been neglected for a long time. Uh, we worked uh, through the 2018 election cycle, and some of us got together after that, and we took a look at what we did, and there was complaining about different things and things we couldn't do right and everything else. We put those complaints aside, and we said to ourselves, we can do better. So we organized... We've recruited, we've trained, we have access to Van, the Voter Action Network, and every club in Oakland County. Uh, we pushed that. The states cooperated with it marvelously. Uh, every weekend, when uh, you're talking about doing telephone calling now or when we were doing Days of Action earlier, Oakland County continues to hit at number one in the state constantly. We need to build on that. Uh, for the future. Right now, I, I just want to give you a little bit of incentive here. Um, in 2016, uh, there were 941,722 registered voters, uh, 678,090 casted ballots, so 72% voted, but 28% did not, and that's in 2016. Additionally, in 2016, when we lost Michigan, 9,165 voters in Oakland County did not vote for president. They voted the rest of the ballot, but they did not vote for president. You know, you can, you can debate what caused that, but I think person-to-person -person contact can change that. Uh, Trump won Michigan by 10,000 votes, and that's a little over two votes per precinct in Michigan. You know, that, that it, so it, it isn't a hard push to change that, I don't think. Uh, 2018, we went up to 948,000. That's 7,000 more over 2016. Um, but once again, 36% didn't vote. Of course, that's off presidential year. It always drops. But you're, you're looking at 336,546 people didn't vote in 18. Those votes are out there. I'm convinced the majority of those votes are ours. That's what we want to push for. Uh, we're projecting, uh, with all the voter registration activities happening, that we're going to have 955,000 to 960,000 registered voters in Oakland County. So we've got a lot of targets out there, a lot of possibilities to get votes. You know, this isn't, this isn't impossible. 
to win this and win it big to flip districts here. You know, I know Julie is going to work on flipping her district, and Karen's killing herself here also. Denise, Denise sorry. <laughs> 44th, yeah, 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 yeah. Like a pancake. Like a pancake. <laughs> so, there's, I mean, there's, there's, we've got good candidates. You know, we really, really do. We have affidavits here tonight. Uh, we do a lot of training around the county. We just had one last uh, weekend in West Bloomfield, Saturday. We had a number of new people there. We continue to do it. We will be in Madison Heights. We're down in Novi. And... We're in Upper Oxford at a bar there. That we got we got great we've got a great room there with a lot of TVs. Everything's good. A lot of uh, imbibing, if you'd like. We'll kind of go anywhere that we're invited. If there's a group of people, small, medium, large, who wants to hear about it, we'll come to you. We have excellent trainers. When we're all volunteers, we're all doing this because we really feel it makes a difference. We're convinced that that uh, personal contact that you're making in your precincts is what's going to push us over the line. And voter turnout can't say that enough. We can't stress how important that will be coming up. Um, some people say, I'm already active. Why should I be a precinct delegate? Well, we asked our precinct delegates what they say about it. And some, here's some of the things they said to meet my neighbors and improve my community, to continue connecting with neighbors even after my kids aren't in school any longer, to find those other like-minded people that I know are there, but they don't know me and I don't know them yet, uh, to motivate them to work. If a neighbor asks a neighbor or someone from their nearby neighborhood to be sure to get out and vote, that means more than a stranger. Um, sometimes we need to do more than vent on social media, which is important. <laughs> I'm guilty. But we, we need to put that action in place, too. And to show what my values are, what we believe in. And that's, that's why we do it. Um, just want to reinforce kind of uh, what Liz said earlier, we don't fill all the slots that we could. The average in Oakland County is 36% filled. That means all those others are empty. Nobody's there. In the Huron Valley area, I tallied it up today, and it comes out to 109 slots and 33 elected precinct delegates which is 33%. So um, let's get that percentage up. Try to fill some more of those slots. All right, so that couldn't be easier, right? You're all doing it already. Do it officially. Do it for the reason it sends a message to the opposition that we do care. You want to know? You want to think they haven't noticed that we don't fill any of those positions, that nobody's on the ballot running for those positions? It's noticed. You know, let's fill them and let's put a little fear out there. Let's just fill every spot we can. Desperate in Highland. Who's in Highland? Who's a Highland member? Just a little guilt and shame here going down. <laughs> okay, who's a, who's a White Lake member? Oh, she's in Florida. Okay. <laughs> she is, actually. A really active White Lake person is in Florida. Oh, okay, White Lake. A little shame going out there. We desperately need people in White Lake. And if you're not willing to run for precinct delegate, we need your name for when we start canvassing. So, um, but we're really underrepresented, especially in, in those areas. So Commerce Township is picking up, but we still, I'm sure there are still precincts. We got a bunch of Commerce Township representatives right there. So think about it. You're really not tasked with doing that much more than you're already doing. Go and do it officially. And it's really cool to send it to your family that you're on the ballot. You know, so amazingly generous with her time and teaching us about election reform and all of the new laws. And I thought I knew about election law before Erica came the first time. And I've learned something new every time she comes. So Erica has a wonderful program training um, poll challengers that she's going to discuss. Another really easy way to get involved. It's a wonderful training. I know I sound like all I do is do stuff, but 
I did take it. Um, it's an online training, and when she says it's going to be an hour, it's an hour. And you will learn, again, so much more stuff that you didn't even know you didn't know. So thank you. Hello, Indivisible. Hello again. <laughs> um, my husband said to me, I thought you were going to send one of your staff people out there. And I said, no, I have to go myself because these are my peeps. I mean, I've been, talk I've been talking to you guys for, for a long time, since before Proposal 3 was even a proposal. Um, so the good news in 2018 was we passed Proposal 3 as well as Proposal 2. So that significantly reformed Michigan's election laws, really increased access to the ballot, took us from, you know, tied for last place with Mississippi to, you know, pretty close to the top. Um, so this is really good. Um, but as you know, what, just because it's in the law doesn't mean that it's necessarily happening on the ground, right? And that's why we need election challengers. Um, we are going to talk about the law itself, because I gave you these little handouts that you can take home to. Um, but I just want to explain what an election challenger is. So on election day, the political parties and certain other organizations are allowed to appoint challengers. Challengers are inside the polling places. They are allowed to actually stand by behind the tables where the, the election, the poll workers hand out the ballots. Um, and crucially, they are allowed to challenge the election workers if they think the election workers are not following the election law. And this happens sometimes, probably more than you think it happens, because Remember, these poll workers are people who don't do this every day. They do it maybe three times a year, maybe. And, you know, the election law is complicated. There's a lot of stuff in there. And sometimes they forget about certain things. Sometimes they haven't been trained really well by their local clerks or by the counties. Um, and so... Sometimes voters are at risk of being disenfranchised by the poll workers. I mean, this happens all over the state. That's why I have the job that I have. Uh, I'm the, I'm the I, should, I guess I should have started with this. I'm the voter protection director for the Michigan Democratic Party. Um, and so um, the challenger role is a really, really important role. Now. Challengers also have the right to challenge a voter's right to vote. We do not do that. The Michigan Democratic Party does not challenge the right of anyone to vote. Certain other political parties who might appoint challengers in the polling places do challenge the rights of voters to vote. And so we're actually in those polling places making sure that those challengers from the Republican, Republican Party, I can't even say it, um, are, not, are not keeping voters from voting. Um, it's, it is a really, really important job. Um, people always ask me, well, do you have to be a lawyer to do this? No, you don't have to be a lawyer. You just have to be willing to be trained to learn what to look for. And then you have to have you know, the personality where you're willing to step up and, and say something if, if you see a problem. The people in this room, I'm going to guess, probably all fit that description. I mean, you guys are all activists. So I think that, that it is a role that you would feel comfortable in because we do train you. We, we do tell you exactly what to look for. You have materials. And in addition, on election day, you have the ability to call in to what we call the um, voter protection boiler room. It's a whole bunch of people in a room answering questions from the field and sorting out problems. And if you encounter a problem that you can't solve with the election worker, then you can call for help. So that is one role that um, I wanted to make you aware of. Another role, did you all realize that 
Each city and township clerk in Michigan hires their own poll workers. Did you know that? Yeah, and most of the cities and townships in our state cannot find enough qualified poll workers, especially the poll workers who operate the electronic poll book. It's a real it's a real hard thing for a lot of the clerks to find. It's especially acute in Detroit. And the reason it's especially acute in Detroit is because Detroit has over 500 precincts, plus this huge absentee counting board. Every election precinct, by law, has to have at least three poll workers. And almost always, they have way more than three three poll workers. They have five or seven each. So do the math. It's a huge number of people that Detroit has to recruit and train for one day. It's just on election day. Um, and, and it's also in the um, absentee counting board that's held at what used to be called Cobo Hall and is now called TCF Center. Um, so they need a lot of people. And you don't have to be a Detroit resident in order to be a poll worker in Detroit or anywhere else in the state. As long as you're a registered voter in Michigan, you can be a poll worker anywhere. So um, the, the Democratic Party is actually helping Detroit um, recruit poll workers. There's also this great new website called michiganvoting.org. It's a um, nonpartisan website that has been created by a coalition of organizations, including the ACLU, the League of Women Voters. Um, it's a whole long list of organizations that you would recognize. Um, and one of the things that website is doing, besides offering really good, simple, clear information about voting is that they're recruiting poll workers. So you can go onto this website, click on be a poll worker, and submit your information. Right now they're doing it just for Detroit, um, but uh, they, want, they want eventually to help other places in the state that need more poll workers. So those are opportunities. If you want to be a challenger. We are starting our training for challengers for the primary. And we're, oh, I should have mentioned, we're going to do a whole full-scale voter protection effort for the primary across the state. Why? Because of those Republican challengers who might be in the polling places. And there was a, we're expecting kind of a different situation this year than we've had in past years because the Republican Party used to be bound by a consent decree that was um, entered into in 1982. And it just expired. And so it, that was actually keeping them from outright voter suppression efforts. Well, they're not bound by that anymore. And they have been speaking about what they intend to do. And guess which one of the states they're really going to be focusing on? Us. Us. Um, so we don't know exactly what they're going to be doing um, during the primary, but we're going to have people in polling places to find out um, and to make sure that our voters are not being um, kept from casting ballots if they are eligible to cast ballots. So um, how to sign up. I'm going to have to get um, Sherry or someone a... Uh, an email, a link to sign up because I don't have a paper sign up form or we're, we're doing it all online. So now I just want to take a few minutes to go over the new voting laws. I think you guys all pretty much know about these laws. I mean, we've been talking about them for a long time. Um, it's all on this sheet. Um, basically, everyone can register all the way through election day now. We no longer have that 30-day deadline to register um, to vote. However, it's a whole lot easier if you register for the primary, and I'm sure everyone in this room is registered, but you may know people who aren't. Um, it's a whole lot easier if you register before February 25th. Why? Because before February 25th, there's a whole lot of ways to register. You can do it online now. We now have online registration. You can do it at the Secretary of State's office. You can do it by mail. You can do it via a registration drive. Starting on February 25th, there is only one way to register, and that's in person 
at your local city or clerk's office. So not the county clerk, but you know the Milford clerk, the White Lake clerk, the you know, et cetera. Um, and in addition, if you register after February 24th, you're going to need proof of residency. Before February 24th, lots of ways to register, no proof of residency. After February 24th, only one way, need proof of residency. I don't know. The former sounds a whole lot easier to me than the latter. So I'm really encouraging people to register before February 25th, especially if they might not have proof of residency. I'm going to guess that all of you have proof of residency. But think about a college student who wants to register in their college town. Are they going to have a driver's license or state ID that has their college town address on it? Are they going to have a utility bill or a bank statement or a paycheck that has their college address on it? Some of them might, but not all of them. If they register before February 25th, they don't need to worry about that. If they wait until February 25th or later, they do have to worry about that. So that's the message that I really want to get out to people that, um, you know, if, if, if you possibly can, register before February 25th. If you're not registered by the time February 25th rolls around, please do register. Please go to your local city or township clerk's office and take your proof of residency with you. Um, and you can even do that on election day. And this is awesome. I mean, this is just, this is a game changer because a lot of times people go to a polling place and they're not in the poll book. And before, there really wasn't much that they could do in that situation other than vote a provisional ballot. Now, you can go to your clerk's office, you can go from the polling place to your clerk's office, register, apply for an absentee ballot, vote it right there, and you're done. Or, if you really want to, you can get a receipt and go to the polling place and, and vote it there if, if there's time. Like, if you are at your clerk's office at 10 minutes till 8 in the evening, there's probably not time for you to go to your polling place, but theoretically, you could. Um, and this is, this is just a real game changer because it means that not being in the poll book doesn't necessarily mean that you can't vote. Um, and I would really prefer that people go and register on election day if they're not in the poll book rather than voting the provisional ballot that goes in the envelope because, you know, those often don't get counted. If it's the last resort, by all means, vote a provisional ballot. But if, if you can go and register on election day, that's really um, a better option. So, you know, this is good. This is, I mean, we've really, really increased ballot access. Um, and all the information is on here. We also have, um, this is new, the Michigan Democratic Party now has a voter assistance hotline, 833-MY-VOTES. Uh, and it's operational now. It'll be operational all through um, 2020. Um, you can call with questions about registering, about voting, um, if you encounter any problems. Um, you can actually even call the voter assistance hotline if you want to sign up to be a challenger. Um, you know, we'll send out the, the link, but you can actually call the, the hotline too. We'll, we'll take care of you. Um, so does anyone have any questions? Yes. You started to say that uh, challenger training would start. Yes. The challenger training is going to start on February 22nd, and we have many options for you. Um, there will be an in-person training in Oakland County, um, in Madison Heights, and um, there will also be several webinar trainings available. And um, it, it's, it's actually going to be a little longer than an hour, this one. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's um, you know we have a lot we have a lot to tell people this time. It's we're, we've scheduled them for each for an hour and a half. Um, we'll try to get them done uh, sooner than that, but we've got that's what we got them scheduled for. The other one I wanted to ask you is she was saying that the way they mean this on the driver's license, print it. They have to put that on and then sign the way they sign. And I'm thinking to myself, 
you can make that leap, right? You know, if they just don't put their middle name down or they just put their initial down and then when they sign, they either put it in or they don't. I mean, seriously? Because if you use your social security number, you can sign any way you want. So I don't, I don't know what's true on that or not. So you are required to have a signature, an official signature for voter registration. And one of the ways that this signature gets used is if you vote absentee and you have to sign the outside of the ballot. And they use the signature to verify that you're you, that nobody is voting your ballot fraudulently. So um, the problem is that our city and township clerks are not trained to you know, match signatures. That's not the training they receive. They receive some, some very basic training in that. So um, I'm actually getting absentee ballot rejection data now. And we're going to try to follow up with voters whose ballots have been rejected. Now, the, the more common reason, okay, anyone want to take a guess? What's the most common reason for rejection of an absentee ballot? They didn't sign the ballot. They didn't sign the Didn't get there in time. Exactly did not get there in time. Absentee ballots have to arrive, arrive, be in the clerk's hand by 8 p.m. on election day. Postmarked on election day does not count. And we saw a huge increase in the number of absentee ballots that were not counted because of late arrival in 2019. The number, the absolute number of absentee ballots that were not counted in November of 2019 was greater than the number not counted in November of 2018 and November of 2016. Just think about that, because November of 2019 was not a statewide election. It was you know, municipal elections. The, the, the number of voters voting was way, way lower. So, we don't know, people are still looking at that data. We don't know exactly what happened there. Did people just put their ballots in the mail too late? Or did they, um, did the post office just take an inordinately long time to deliver the ballots? We don't know. Um, the post office says that in Michigan, two to three days should be, I wouldn't put my ballot in the mail later than a week before election day. And that's what I'm telling voters. If you've got that ballot in your hand on March 3rd, which by the way is Super Tuesday, so many people may still have their ballot in their hands um, on March 3rd, I would feel a lot more comfortable taking it into the clerk's office and dropping it off there. But you know, I'm fully aware of the fact that many people may not be able to do that for transportation reasons, for time reasons, or whatever. So to them I say, okay, put your ballot in the mail a week before, at least a week before election day. And do you guys all know, know how to um, track your ballot? Okay, pull out your phone. Go to michigan.gov slash vote. So what you should come up with is this screen that says, are you registered? This is, the, this is the screen, this is the tool that we have that you can look to see if you're registered or not. But it also allows you to track your absentee ballot. So if you put in your information, and it's not a lot of information that they're asking you for. It's just your first name, your last name, the month that you were born, the year that you were born, and your zip code. And then press search by name. Got it? Okay, so if you, if you applied for an absentee ballot, it will show you when they received your application for an absentee ballot, when, you mailed out, when they mailed out the ballot to you, and when they received the ballot back. What signatures did the clerk actually compare, for example? I'm 82 now. My signature is not the way it was 15, 20 years ago. I know. I know. Is that a problem? Um, usually not, but it could be. Um, they're not looking for an exact match. Fortunately, we do not have a law that says the signature has to be an exact match to the signature on file. But they're looking to see if it's wildly different. And look, I will, 
I will be honest with you. There are people who like sign their spouse's name. Sometimes their deceased spouse's name. Um, and that's what they're looking for. Um, and if your signature is slightly different from your driver's license signature from s many, many years ago, they might, they might call you to find out you know, if that was really you. They might ask you to come in and, and sign again so that they can verify it. I mean, if, if, as long as you figure out the problem before election day, you can fix it. Like it's not, just because your absentee ballot gets rejected because of lack of signature, that doesn't mean you're disenfranchised. That just means you have to go in and sign the thing be before they will be able to count it. Or you could go into your polling place on election day if you're, if you're able to. Yes? I just renewed my license and I had to sign again. Um, the only thing, I, correct me if I'm wrong, is that your voting address must be your driver's license address. Yes, that is true. So in Michigan, we do have this address match law, which says that you have to use the same address for your voting registration and for your driver's license. So if you change your voter registration address, let's say you're a college student and you decide, oh, I'm going to register in my college town instead of voting absentee from home, that will automatically change your driver's license address. That, that is actually a, a voter suppression technique. It was, it was passed specifically to, to suppress the college vote, and it's worked. Um, and we haven't, we haven't been able to get that changed because of our legislature. We're working with the uh, uh, registering the eligible high school students now, and we stress eligibility for signature and that kind of thing. But if I heard it correctly, you said, because we've been telling them, if you switch your voting to your college resident town, you need to switch your driver's license address as well. Now, I just heard you say it's automatic. It's automatic. They don't have, so if they, let's say they're registered in Milford and they go to college somewhere else in Michigan. If they register to vote in their college address, their license address will automatically be changed and they'll be sent a sticker. They don't have to actually go on and do it. The question was, does it work in reverse too? If you change your, um, your driver's license address, does it change your voting address too? The answer is yes. And a lot of people get tripped up by this because they don't realize the two databases are actually linked. Thank you. We have a couple of different campaign updates. Nancy Check, do you want to go first? Hi, most of you know me, I'm Nancy Check. Um, I'm going to get into the election part, but I had a couple things that I wanted to pass along to you. Um, first of all, Blessings in a Backpack is having their annual charity event. And everybody, if you don't know what Blessings in a Backpack is, I'll set, state it briefly. Uh, they provide meals for students at Huron Valley Schools uh, over the weekend. Um, for those kids who are on the free and reduced lunches. And it keeps them fed and ready to learn um, for Monday. So um, they rely very heavily, I mean, they rely solely on our donations, on donations of the community. So um, their annual big fundraiser is on March 28th. What did I write down? Uh, March 28th, and it is a comedy show. And it is at um, uh, 59 West. Um, in Highland, and it will include dinner. And um, we already have one table uh, for eight. I'd like to get a second table of eight put together. Uh, and if we get a table of eight per person, the cost is uh, $62.50 plus $4 uh, for uh, processing fees. So if you're interested in going, I'm going to pass this sheet around. Uh, please sign up. Um, that doesn't mean, if you sign on this, you're not obligated. If you just want more information, I won't be putting in a table until I get confirmation on this. But if you want more information, I'll send it on to you. Could you start that, John? Thank you. All right, that, that's my one, my one announcement. The other thing that I want to talk about is one issue, very, very, very briefly, uh, that may be of concern uh, to uh, candidates that they may not be on, that might not be on their radar right now. Uh, but July 1st ends uh, no-fault insurance in the state of Michigan. 
And if you haven't had a chance to hear the speakers, there's a speaker bureau, a, a group of speakers going around the state. I went to uh, one last night at White Lake Library, and um, they're informing people about the changes to the law and what impact it will have. Um, it is pretty much still, there's a bunch of, it was passed in the middle of the night, in the dark, as they say, and uh, there are a lot of holes in that bill, and um, all, what a lot of people aren't aware of is uh, there was promise that there would be a 10% or a reduction in uh, the cost to insurance. That is only on the PIP, which is the personal injury protection. Um, the side that might uh, that most likely will get bumped up significantly is that side of liability because um, this allows for a large number of people to be underinsured, which means since we now have fault insurance after July 1st, it will mean that the way to recover, if you're at fault, the way that uh, the person will recover their expenses is to sue you. So people will be carrying a lot more uh, personal liability insurance Anyways, it gets more and more complicated when we get into pedestrians, but the sector of people that will probably be most affected will be senior citizens um, who are more likely to, I'm sorry to say, I'm, I'm a senior, um, will most likely get into accidents and also be more likely to be injured catastrophically. So it will significantly uh, affect a lot of us and it will also significantly affect those people like Jonathan who someday might have his son driving and um, then uh, you then, if your child gets into an accident, then you too can be sued at all. So anyways, it's just an FYI for candidates who are out there to look into it because I think that might hit you really hard when you're campaigning over the summer. I want everybody to grab this half sheet of paper that's on your table. Uh, this is for Denise Forrest. Denise, stand up. She is running for the 44th. <laughs> Our, our group gets very much involved in the 44th because we're in the 44th right now. And um, so uh, this, this is a pretty comprehensive volunteer form, and this is what we learned from Laura's campaign. I was um, Laura's official um, volunteer wrangler. <laughs> That's what she called me. Um, so, and now I'm Denise's. So if you could fill this out. Um, please use the pens that are on the table. So with that, I'm going to pass this on to Sherry, who's going to actually talk about what we'll be doing. Um, we're really all excited about the, um, the upcoming uh, election. Okay, it's time to get ready to work. You know, this is where we get really serious about elections in 2020. Um, we have a 2020 democracy team and uh, I'm gonna introduce them tonight because they're putting in a lot of time. They're doing a lot of volunteer hours. We meet every month and we've met, met every month for uh, three months now. And this, steer, this is a steering committee. And they've been set up to create a plan for tackling all this work we've got to do in 2020 uh, election cycle. Um, in fact, what we're doing is we're setting a timeline of the months leading up and what we're going to be doing each month. And um, you're going to hear a lot more details about that at our meeting in March. But tonight I wanted you to meet the uh, Democracy 2020 team. So if you guys would stand up, you know who you are. Karen Adams, Jim and Donna Williams, Nancy Check, Pat Hensey, is Larry here? Larry LeClaire is on the team, and uh, Allison Rose, and um, and and Liz, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Sorry, Liz. It's just you know a given, right? <laughs> so our very first indivisible Huron Valley campaign event is coming up on March fifth. And that is going to be a postcard party at Michelle Peltier. You want to stand up there? She's going to be our host. Okay. Now, her address and information is on your agenda tonight at the bottom. So you can see. And it's also going to be in the newsletter. And this is very exciting because this, po this um, postcard party is for Julia Pulver. Whoop, back there. Yay. Julia is running. 
uh, for the State House and District 39. And uh, she is one of the, the many uh, House districts in Southeast Michigan that we're going to flip this time. Yeah. Yes, right? And Denise is the other one we're going to flip for sure. Yeah. And those are the two House districts that we're really going to be dedicating ourselves to. Uh, we have a growing population of uh, residents in commerce in our group now. So that's the part of our uh, indivisible group that Julia will be representing. And of course, Denise will represent most of us in, in the indivisible Huron Valley group. So um, our very first event is, her, is at uh, Michelle's house to write postcards on March 5th. So I hope you can be there. So keep an eye on our Facebook page, our website, uh, the newsletters. So there will be more actions for Julia and and we're really starting to get revved up for um, uh, Denise's campaign. I was with uh, her today, and she's working very hard going through all the hoops that we need to go through to get, get going. And, of course, our first step is what you're going to be doing tonight, and that's filling out those volunteer forms because we're going to start getting going on that. I'm going to pass this around. This is for Julia. Uh, um, postcard party. So um, I know some of you may have indicated you're going on our Facebook page, but this would help us knowing how much food we need if we get just a rough count of how many. So I'm going to pass that around to to sign up. You can just now register. We are now Powder Swing left. So we have a mobilized account. So you can now even register through our Facebook page and we will get an automatic response that you are coming to the party. So we'll be using that more and more for our events. So if you see it on Facebook, instead of just writing in the comments from now on, yeah, I want to go, click on that and we'll automatically know how to reach you. If the venue changes, the time changes, we'll have all your information. Another thing that's happening before we meet again tonight, I'm just talking about the things that are going to happen before our March meeting, um, is we are sending out our candidate surveys uh, to the candidates, local candidates, uh, in order to endorse them. Um, we are a nonpartisan group. And because we want to keep that in our mission statement, we want to officially endorse candidates running locally. So we are sending out a candidate survey that we've put together um, that is uh, based around our values. And so we're going to send them to the candidates of both parties, and those who wish our endorsement will fill them out. Um, it's, it's a nice short one, uh, it, but it gives us an indication of how you support our indivisible values. And then we can officially uh, endorse these candidates and go all out for them, put all their events on our Facebook page and, and really be fully out there you know, working for them. But we do want to go through this endorsement process. So that is something we're doing. And then the other thing that we're doing that is very important. Next Monday, uh, our uh, representative, Matt Maddock, has actually publicized a coffee hour. And this coffee hour is at 3.30 in the afternoon. It's on your agenda at Leo's Coney Island. Now, if you can possibly get away at 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the afternoon, next Monday, it would really be wonderful if you could be there. Um, we want to make sure that he knows we're paying attention. And the other thing that's gonna happen before we meet again in March is March 10th is our the Michigan primary, as you know, presidential primary. And um, if you haven't voted by absentee already, hopefully you're going to be doing that or you're gonna vote in person, but this is just a plug to make sure that you do it. Um, we all share a common goal, and that's waking up on November 4th with um, a new start, you know, a new administration on the horizon. And so I want everyone to envision in their mind who they want, who, you, who do you really envision standing on that podium um, in January, taking the low oath of office? And who do you think is the best person to heal our nation and to pull us together. And, um, and so think about that when you're voting and really truly uh, vote for who you think is going to make the best president. And we've got three or four weeks before uh, the election. Whoever it is, make a few phone calls, knock on a few doors. 
you know, do a little bit more. Throw them a few bucks. Really actually uh, get involved rather than letting someone else make that decision for you. Okay, so I think it's really important to get involved in that process. But above all, vote and take two or three people that you know to the polls with you and get them engaged. So that's all I've got. Thank you. All right, I don't want to short Mr. Wittenberg, who made a drive out here to be with us. So we're going to really, we have a couple, Julia has a couple things, part of campaign update. Before we meet again, I just want to put a plug in for two different things. Um, as you sit at home getting more and more angry about the state of our state and the world, why not, instead of like angry tweeting or putting on Facebook, whip out your own little kit of postcards. <laughs> flip the 39th uh, state house seat and uh, these go really quick Kelly's been sitting here she's probably gotten through about 40 as long as we've been sitting here they go real fast um, our goal is to reach or to get 22,000 of these out by April 1st we've already gone through about 6,000 of these by our count so please come to the postcard party but in the meantime you don't have to wait for a party you can do it right now come see me when we're all done and then the other thing is on that Tuesday, uh, I'm having a Pulver Punch key party <laughs> to uh, bring some humor and some a uh, little bit of you know tongue and cheekedness to some of the fun uh, attack ads that happened last time around. If you don't know the story, come ask me afterward, and I will tell you the story. But so Fat Tuesday, the 25th, Karen's making the punch key, which is <laughs> so. Um, we are hoping to see you there. It's in Commerce at Uptown Grill, 6 o'clock on the 25th. Hope to see you all there. Woo! Leo, because he made a special trip here. Um, you have two minutes. You have like a minute, Leo. Okay, I'll be fast. For Sherry's guests. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Leo McCaffrey. If you recognize me, that's because I was last here uh, helping to elect Haley Stevens. And yeah, and I'm back. Um, this time um, I'm with the Elizabeth Warren campaign. Uh, I just got back from Iowa, and I'm so happy that it's 20 degrees, not negative three like it was in Iowa. But make it quick. I'm here to help make sure we elect Elizabeth Warren. So if you want to help us knock doors, make phone calls, I'll be there in the back at the end of the meeting. I'll also probably be calling you because I will be calling you. So thank you so much. You. Sorry to rush you. All right, two other real quick pieces of housework. Kali, we have a messaging workshop coming up. A framing workshop and this time we're gonna actually practice and do some role playing um, it's at a private residence so if you want to come RSVP online the links at the bottom there and we'll tell you or come ask me afterwards but she just asked that her yeah. personal address not yeah it's at a there. private residence this time so but anyway it'd be fun because we actually we've learned a lot if you haven't learned a lot don't worry it's gonna start out with a presentation but then we'll practice a little bit thank you and Henry has it our first ever Morning after discussion. Yeah, we don't know what else to call it. John thought of something better to call it, actually. I just chuckle every time I say that. How about task force? Or how about the. Uh, no uh, morning uh, after discussion. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like yeah. uh, anyways, uh, we've been throwing this idea around a couple of months, I think, and you guys have been a long time. Um, just another way to kind of build some more community. Come together at, uh, we're thinking what, Thursday or tomorrow, 10 o'clock, at um, Starbucks. Starbucks. <laughs> and if it's too it's small, your agenda. we can always move over to uh, Tim Hortons because that could accommodate a large group. Uh, but you know, we hear a lot of information here uh, when we come to these meetings. And the, the, the task of this group would be to try to summarize what, what, was, what you heard, what, what uh, any other opinions that would help us uh, formulate something we can put in the next newsletter so people can just kind of get a recap of, of what we heard here tonight. Thank you. So, so Henry put the work into putting that up. Uh, Hopefully some people will show up, share a cup of coffee. Starbucks and... Starbucks and... Hey. Oh. <laughs> yep. Other quick thing is uh, our voter registration group is, we've already kind of kicked off the year. I don't know if we have 100 plus kids we've registered already. We've been to South Lyon, Waterford, um, 
uh, yeah, Northern. And tomorrow's uh, another Waterford. We went to OOA today. Um, Rob and I went out to a, an adult ed uh, program and got two of them. So hey, we're. <laughs> we got, plus they signed us up for remedial English. <laughs> <laughs> the Waterford one I signed in for the talent show. So All right. I get to come. But anyways, uh, we're also meeting uh, this Saturday, 10 o'clock at the Milford Library. So if you want to come and be a part of this group, uh, we can always use volunteers. And just like this group here, if you come to our meetings, it's great. If you don't, you don't have to. But when you can come, uh, just give us some of your time. It's a lot of fun. Uh, tomorrow we're going to Waterford Kettering. Kettering High School to uh, register the kids. All, all day to register more kids. So like I said, right, right now we're about 100 plus and uh, more to come. More to come. All right. So, Mr. Wittenberg, we do not end precisely at 8.30, so do not feel like you have to <laughs> rush through, but we really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us. Um, I'm going to let him tell you his whole resume, but as you all know, he's running for treasurer for Oakland County. A lot of us know him because of all the great work he did for gun safety and working against Voldemort when Voldemort was in. <laughs> Actually, you I call, know, I know. I we that. met at a VMP event, right. and, and I, he asked where I was from, and I told him, he says, oh, you're in Voldemort's district. And so I have called him that ever since because it suits. Um, so a lot of people know him from that wonderful work. And uh, there you go. Thank you. Uh, what a great group here, and uh, yeah, I was, wasn't too worried about the time, but it's amazing all the work that you're actually doing. I commend you on uh, the, the amount of work that you're doing within this group. Uh, I'm actually coming straight from the state of the county. Actually, tonight is the state of the county for Oakland County, uh, and Dave Coulter, who's the first ever Democratic uh, county executive is delivering the state of the county address. So I was coming from there, uh, and I also bring regards from Laura Dodd, uh, who was there, and I saw her. Uh, and she's like, oh yeah, you're heading over to my, my area and, and with my people. I said, absolutely, and I'll, I'll send your regards. Uh, so I'll do two things, kind of like the, the side of, so I'm a, my name's Robert Wittenberg. I'm a third term state representative uh, in the house. I serve the areas of Berkeley, Huntington Woods, Oak Park, Ferndale, Pleasant Ridge, Hazel Park, and Royal Oak Township. Uh, seven wonderful communities right in the southeast corner of Oakland County. A uh, very small, compact uh, district. A lot of communities, but a very small, compact district. We're literally from 8 Mile to 12 Mile, and then from Greenfield to DeQuinder, if people know that area pretty well. Uh, in my third and final term, as I said, uh, unfortunately, I have served in the minority all three terms, uh, and that is something that needs to change this year. Uh, this is the year, absolutely. And I know it's group, groups like yours that are going to help push us over the finish line. Uh, Right now, the, the makeup of the legislature is 58 to 52, uh, Republican to Democrat. And so we only need three seats to tie or four seats to win. And we have quite a few seats right here just in Oakland County that we can flip. We have two candidates here tonight. Uh, we know that it's so I, I could just tell you how frustrating it is serving in the minority in Lansing, uh, as we talked about some of the legislation. So uh, one of the main things, and, and people here might know me from the, uh, there was a town hall that was Haley Stevens and myself and Christine Gregg uh, on gun violence prevention at the, it's at the Multi Lakes Conservation. So most of you, uh, so you've seen me there. Um, and that was the most interesting experience of my life. Uh, I would say the craziest experience of my life. Uh, that was something. Uh, so I am the uh, founder and chair of our Legislative Gun Violence Prevention Caucus. Uh, and so this is something I've been doing since I first got into the legislature. Uh, introducing such crazy things as universal criminal background checks that 95% of people support, gun owners and non-gun owners alike. Right? I mean, if, if you're going to own a weapon, we should just make sure that you're qualified to own the weapon, that you're not going to, uh, you know, because there are, there are preclusions why someone should not or could not purchase a weapon. Also working on legislation like the red flag laws. People have heard about the red flag laws. So someone is a threat to themselves or someone else that we have some kind of recourse to be able to uh, temporarily seize their weapons and get them the help that they need. But serving in the minority with all the, uh, the, the gun safety bills that we've, we've introduced, including safe storage laws, um, things like that, we have never got a single hearing 
in Lansing for any of them. And I've been working on other legislation like a graduated income tax proposal. Currently, we have a flat income tax here in the state of Michigan. So I've been working on that. We have to amend our constitution, but as legislators, we could actually send it to the ballot to amend our constitution. Uh, it is inherently, the, the, the uh, income tax is inherently regressive. Uh, there's, if everyone knows uh, Warren Buffett, right? Warren Buffett, he's, he's quoted as saying that he pays a smaller percentage of his taxes versus his secretary. Uh, and that's the issue here. When we look at your, your taxes as a whole, uh, that this is something that is really regressive and hurts people at the lower end and, and middle class and, you know, uh, people in the middle. And so this is something that we've been working on, uh, again, since I got into the legislature, trying to find, you know, get, get tax fairness and tax equality here in the state. Uh, working on a lot of environmental issues. I know this area, this is, environment is something that is so critical to all of you, surrounded by all the water here. Uh, I was the leading person trying to stop Nestle, if everyone remembers, the permit that Nestle has. So I had the resolution trying to uh, keep, the, you know, the governor had to uh, approve, or the uh, DEQ at the time, had to approve the permit. We were trying to stop them from approving that permit. Um, I actually introduced legislation, so this one's really interesting. Uh, it is call, it's called, and it got a lot of uh, traction all across the country, we call it the ban on the ban on the ban. And what it is is that uh, Washtenaw County originally tried to uh, ban plastic bags and single-use uh, like polyurethane containers. And then the state, while I was serving there, and it was unfortunately the Republicans who came through and said, no, you shouldn't be able to ban or uh, do any, you know, anything with, um, regulate any kind of single-use containers. And so they pushed a one-size-fits-all approach across the state saying you can't do this. And so I introduced legislation to repeal that. So in essence, we literally called it, they, there was a community that tried to ban plastic bags and single-use containers. The state ended up banning the banning, and then I'm trying to ban the banning of banning. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a long way to just say, like, giving local control back to our communities, right? I mean. You, you always hear people on the other side of the aisle say that the party of local control, but only when it suits them, right? So we see, unfortunately, in Lansing, we've seen a lot of different times where uh, they've tried to do statewide approaches to things. Uh, and so this is something, again, I care about the environment. I think every community should be able to say, uh, you know, if we see all the plastic garbage that's piling up in our community, we should be able to either ban it or if they want to tax it, right? What if they want to say, you know what, we should charge 10 cents a bag so people are a little more conscious of they're not taking five bags for six items. Right. So those are some of the things I've been working on in Lansing. And again, not one of them has got a hearing uh, because we're serving in the minority. And I can tell you this, the majority party controls everything that goes on. Everything. Every bill that gets a hearing, uh, even when it comes down to like staff, their staff, so each of us as legislators in the House, we get two staff members that work in our office, but ultimately they work at the uh, pleasure of the Speaker of the House. So the Speaker could literally, and this has happened before I was there, but I've heard stories about the Speaker literally fired all the employees that worked for uh, the opposing party, the, the Democratic Party, brought them back like the next day, but just wanted to flex muscle saying, this is the power that I have. So this is the kind of stuff. So. That's why it's so important. When we say we need to get four seats, three to tie, four to win, it's so that we can push through uh, and get things actually passed uh, that we believe in, right? So the, an agenda that we believe in that's trying to help uh, the everyday people of the state, the environment, trying to prevent gun violence in this state, um, for workers' rights, all these different things, women's rights, all these different things that, that we all uh, uh, believe in. We can't get anything accomplished because of that. Uh, another thing, so you're, uh, and we talked about Voldemort briefly, uh, and so I will not say anything more. I, I was taught that if you don't have something nice to say about someone, then don't say anything at all. I have nothing to say about him at all. Uh, it has been uh, an interesting experience. Uh, and then just to end on the uh, legislative side of things, I brought a, uh, we put together this kind of, a, it's like a one-pager here, it's a trifold here, um, that lists, and, and unfortunately, I'm sorry you have to deal with my face on here, but uh, it lists all the leadership in Lansing, so it has like the governor's information, the lieutenant governor, secretary of state, attorney general, the leadership, uh, all the House and Senate members, it has what committees they serve on, it has their email, their phone number, uh, so I encourage you, as legislation comes up and you want to make your voice heard, uh, utilize this. This is a good form to utilize so you can, if there's a bill that you're uh, supportive of, 
You can let them know if there's something you're opposed to. You can let them know. Uh, but this is a really handy form uh, to be able to uh, stay engaged and um, talk to your elected officials. So let me step back then uh, from that side of things. And I'm, I'll be brief, I guess. Uh, I guess I have a few minutes over. But uh, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing uh, my last term in the House. Uh, we can another time. I'll come back and talk to you about term limits and and why I think they're really bad. Uh, yeah, Just briefly, right? So uh, you know, like any industry, right? Any any profession, it takes time to really get to know what you're doing. Uh, we have the most restrictive term limits in the country. So to you know, six years, we can serve three two-year terms in the House and two four-year terms in the Senate. Also, it's a relationship business, and I can tell you that I actually had more uh, legislation passed my first term uh, than any other Dem uh, in the House. I was able to get more because I actually worked across the aisle and uh, got to get some things passed. Unfortunately, those, you know, some of those priorities I talked about earlier didn't get a hearing, but found some other common ground. Uh, the other thing is, is that people are so short-sighted uh, when you're only serving for six years. So just quickly, I'll tell you this story. Uh, you know, I'm working on uh, implementing a graduated income tax here in the state of Michigan. And this would honestly save money for 95% of taxpayers in the state of Michigan, right? If we just uh, have a more equitable system and, and tax the top 5% yeah. fairly, we would generate over $2 billion of new revenue every single year based on a, one of the plans that we were working on. So uh, there was actually an, a, a push while I was there to actually abolish and do away with the state income tax with no, no plans to backfill it. Right? So, which would cut about a 20% hole in our budget here in the state of Michigan. And so, when I talked to the, uh, the, the lead sponsor of the bill, and he talked about you know, this legislation and why he felt it was really good, and he said, well, the money will go back into people's pockets and then they'll reinvest in, in the state, which we know is not true, right? The whole trickle down kind of economics, it's, it's not going to work, right? I said, okay, so that's probably not going to happen. But there's no way we're going to get that much. But what happens, I mean, if we don't fill it? He said, you know what? It gets phased in over 20-something years. I won't be serving here, and you won't be serving here. So it's not our issue to deal with. So, And you hear that all the time. There are a lot of uh, legislators who come in, and they say, again, they're sh serving for a short period of time. And they say, here is my pet project. This is what I told my voters I would get done. Whether it is uh, like detrimental to our long-term you know, safety and, and, and a viability of our state. They're like, you know what, I'm going to do this. And I've heard many times, again, in, in Lansing, the staff and the lobbyists have the institutional knowledge and memory. And there have been multiple times when something passed uh, and someone's like, yeah, this was tried 20, 30 years ago. And then they ultimately had to repeal it. So term limits, not a big fan. All right, off my soapbox on that one. Uh, so what am I doing next? I'm actually running for Oakland County Treasurer. Uh, Andy Meisner, who is our current treasurer, is running for county executive. So it's an open seat, yes. Uh, it's an open seat, and I'm running for this seat. Uh, as of now, I'm the only Democrat in the race. Uh, I hope it stays like that, because it'll make it a really easy campaign. Uh, but I've been really getting out there and doing the work. Uh, I'm glad to have uh, a lot of great endorsements, including Attorney General Dana Nessel, uh, Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence, and uh, Andy Levin, uh, all of my legislative colleagues, so all the uh, senators and House members in Oakland County, uh, Democrats, uh, have their endorsement. Uh, and so why I'm, I think I'm qualified for this position, so my background uh, originally what I did prior to serving in the legislature is I'm a licensed health and life insurance agent. So did that and, and did a lot of employee benefits and retirement benefits, trying to find people you know, so they can retire with financial security and dignity. Uh, so I think that positions me really well for the position. Uh, as far as the committees I've been serving on in Lansing, uh, I'm on the tax policy committee. I'm on financial services. I was the minority vice chair for two terms of the financial liability reform committee. And then I'm the minority vice chair, so like the head Democrat on the insurance committee. Uh, and I could talk to you about the, wherever you, you were talking about the uh, no fault. Uh, I was opposed to it uh, because of all those glaring holes in, in what they were doing, right? I mean, it's like we did pass it in the middle of the night after like it's a broad sweeping change that impacts everyone in this state and we had just a couple hours to review over 100 pages and had to vote on it like that um and i thought there were so many other things we could have been doing uh without 
taken away the integrity of the system. We have the best uh, you know, insurance coverage in the country, and we can hang our hat on that. Do we pay too much? Yes. And there are ways that we could have addressed cost by dealing with fraud in the system uh, and putting in you know, uh, fee schedules, certain things we could have done without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So I wasn't a fan of that, but I've been serving on the insurance committee, so this is something that I've been uh, really w keenly aware of uh, and working on. So with those committees that I've been working on and my background, I think I'm really well qualified uh, to, to be the next Oakland County Treasurer. I think Andy Meisner has done a great job. And so I am not coming in saying that I'm going to blow up the whole system. I think we need someone who can continue the legacy. And we want someone who is, in my mind, I think someone who's trustworthy uh, and who's open and transparent. And I think uh, that I, I am that. I am the person who I have uh, community conversations at least twice a month, and I broadcast them to the whole district. I want everyone to show up. I know there's some reps in, in here in the state who are very, uh, they don't want certain people to show up at their coffee hours. I want everyone to show up because I want to be accessible. I want people to know who I am. Uh, I give out my email and my phone number at every meeting that I go to. Uh, I think it's, for me, it's about public service. And so I, I, I truly love helping people. Uh, and so I see this as a great opportunity to continue doing that. This has been a very uh, challenging but very rewarding position because we can affect change on small levels, right? Every day to day, to day with people come to us with cons constituent services. If they're having issues with state government, we can help them out. And obviously on a broad scale when we're, we're impacting the laws that, that affect everyone here in the state of Michigan. So there's things that I also want to do a little differently. I mean, bringing a fresh perspective into the treasurer's office, trying to do a little bit more of economic development and trying to help small businesses uh, across the county. Uh, this is something where it's not necessarily the fault of Andy Meisner, but our previous county executive uh, really handcuffed the, the office and, and wouldn't let them do certain things. So I want to be able to, to do some of that. I'm also currently working with uh, Andy and the County Treasurer's Association to try to implement policies currently while I'm, I'm, I'm in the legislature, some laws that I'm working on, uh, including one that would uh, currently with the foreclosure process, right? The foreclosure, when foreclosure is kind of the one thing that the treasurer is known for doing, um, I would like to change that and obviously do a lot of other things. But a foreclosure is the last case scenario. That is something that we never want people to go through because not only is it bad for that person, but it's bad for their neighbors and the whole community uh, is impacted by that. And so we're working on right now with, with the, the foreclosure process, it's pretty cut and dry, unfortunately, in the law. When you get to roughly about three years down the road, you have to foreclose on a property. And so trying to give, I have legislation that's trying to give more discretion to the county treasurers, especially when it comes to uh, de minimis amounts or small amounts. And so working on that legislation, also if people have read in the paper, they've talked about with uh, Wayne County, there are taxes, people there have tax bills that are higher than what their houses are actually worth, um, which is crazy. And so working on trying to forgive some of those and give more discretion again to the treasurers so that they don't have to kick people out of their house uh, and they can actually change the amount that is owed. Um, so working on quite a few different things uh, that hopefully if I do become our county treasurer that will be in the toolbox uh, if I'm elected. And so I truly believe you know, that we have to make sure everyone is represented in Oakland County and make sure that I am a voice for everyone in Oakland County. And like I said, with the work that I did before, uh, making sure people, uh, you know, your, your house, your purchase of your house is the biggest investment you are going to make in your lifetime. And so making sure people have financial security and making sure that they have, uh, they're in a good position to live with dignity, retire with dignity. Uh, and so I really think that I'm the, the person that is positioned well uh, to continue the legacy of Andy Meisner and to be, uh, you know, to get out and beat the uh, Republican challenger in uh, November. And so, like I said, I'm the, I'm the only one as of now who's in the race. Uh, the filing deadline isn't until April 24th, but I've been really getting out there speaking to groups all across the county. It is a vast county. It's, there's a lot here, and I've, you know, I've been to groups all over. Uh, and so I'm just trying to get out there and get my message out to people and just get my name in, in front of you. Um, so I just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with all of you. Uh, I'll stick around for a little. I know I, I went over, so uh, I want to leave you guys. Uh, but I'll, I'll stick around for a few minutes. I have um, I already missed bedtime. I have a 19-month-old baby at home, uh, which is fine. I try to get home most nights, but I knew tonight was going to be a late night. Uh, and then I guess the last thing I would say is I want the county 
to thrive and I want everyone to, to really want to live in Oakland County long term because I have a 19 month old, but we also have another baby. March 17th, we have a scheduled C-section. So yeah, so we'll have a, a, a second uh, baby here. I'm, I am excited and exhausted thinking about it right now. Uh, but I, you know, I grew up, I'm actually living in the community that I grew up in. Uh, and my daughter, and then we actually don't know what we're having in the second one. We'll go to the same school district that I grew up in, in the Berkeley School District. So I really love this county uh, and want to continue serving this county. So I appreciate you all being here. I'm going to leave uh, these pamphlets that I told you about so you can contact your legislators. And then uh, I also have some information about me and the campaign uh, and also some emery boards, uh, some nail files, because uh, I actually had them from my first campaign and I, people just kept asking about them and asking for them. So uh, I have those. Yeah, they're over there. Uh, you have yours. Oh, Julia had hers in her purse. Uh, so I will bring those and I'll put those out somewhere here. Uh, and just thank you all for having me. And I see all like the cupcakes and all the bacon. This is... Yeah, I, I might have to do that. Oh, that's why. Okay, so you're celebrating. Congrats. Congrats, all. But, like, again, I, I'll finish with this then uh, on, on the broad scale uh, of why it's so important that we need to get out and vote this year uh, up and down the ticket. And I kind of talked to you about it on the House side, right? Because whoever has, holds the levers of power, right, they can, they can push through whatever they want or they can, you know, they can keep you down if there's things that you're working on. But what I've seen, unfortunately, more than anything, and this has changed. I was first elected in 2014, but in 2016, uh, just the rhetoric and just the, uh, the, the, um, the vitriol, right? I mean, just what you see and what we've seen out of the White House, uh, we all agree, right, how terrible, how racist and sexist and, and just mean-spirited it is. But what I want to uh, highlight for all of you is that it's not just there. You have no one in the Republican Party calling him out for what he's doing, and they're complicit in what he is doing. And so it's important that we get people elected that share our values, and we have these people in leadership positions where we control the message, where we control the policy that gets implemented. And so this year, uh, I know I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, but I know you, you preach to the choir so they can sing, right? So we're here preaching to all of you. Uh, get out this year. Uh, make every phone call that you can. Knock on your, 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 door, uh, your neighbor's doors. Tell your family and friends. Um, this is such an important election year. Uh, I don't know if it's hyperbole to say that this is the most important election for sure in my lifetime. Uh, and so a long time. So I just I, I encourage you all to get out and do it. And I thank you for the work that you, you've been doing and that I know you're going to continue to do. And I appreciate you having me here today. Thank you.